I want to talk about Robert Grosstest, who, um, who I feel is not only the, one of the most impressive people to come from this city, but is also um, probably the one um, the, the most um, overlooked as well. But just to set the scene, I, 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 he is a 13th century bishop. And if there is one term that is most misapplied to the Middle Ages, it is it is the Dark Ages. It is a time of great superstition. Uh, people thought the world was flat and the sky was going to fall on their heads and they eked out a miserable existence, saved only now and again by um, the superstitions that they clung to. Um, I want to challenge that, um, that, that caricature of the Middle Ages, and I want to do it by um, exploring Robert Cross test, because um, in this 13th century bishop, in this philosopher, this theologian, this poet, we also find remarkably in the Middle Ages, first class scientist. And that is something I think which is rather remarkable and it challenges the misconceptions I think that we generally have and are still um, so persistent to this day. Um, Robert Crosstest, let me start at the beginning. The Chronicles tell us this and it's uh, it's got a ring of legend about it, this story, but that does not mean to say that it isn't true. We are told that at the age of nine years old, he is sent off from Suffolk by his mother and go seek an education, and there are no universities. So where do you go to seek an education? You go to the cathedral, and he sets off for Lincoln, but before he does, his mother gives him a pearl of wisdom, which is going to serve him well in his life. And she tells him to always value the food of the mind over the food of the belly. And with this in his head, he heads off towards Lincoln to the great um, seat of learning, which is Lincoln Cathedral. And um, as he arrives there, he notices the first big house, the first wealthy house. And this happens to be the house of the new mayor of Lincoln. And he knocks on the door looking for assistance. And the mayor opens the door, we are told, and takes one look at this urchin in front of him. And he says to him, you can have this capon, this roasted chicken, you can have it now but you make me one promise, you will never become the Bishop of Lincoln. And we are told that Robert Grosstest, remembering the words of wisdom from his mother says, I refuse and walks away. <laughs> and now the mayor is so impressed that he calls him back and says, oh, you were looking for help. And he said, I was looking for assistance in education, not in eating. And the mayor is so impressed by this that he pays for his education in Lincoln Cathedral. And if that chronicle is true, and it may be, then that is that mayor is responsible for the beginning of a truly spectacular academic career. Well, what's so special about Robert Grosstest? Well, he has been um, described as the first modern scientist, huge claim, the first modern scientist in the 13th century. And why was that? Well, it's because of a deceptively simple idea he has. And the idea is this, that in order to learn stuff, we observe, we look. You look at stuff in order to learn stuff. And this is deceptively simple, but it hasn't been round as an idea since the Greeks. People looked at stuff before. I read um, a beautiful account before, which is highly typical of how they observed things before. You look at things in nature in order to find out theological truths. So there is a wonderful guy called Gerald of Wales who's walking around Ireland and observing things and learning from nature. And he watches an osprey swimming into, gliding into the water and picking up a fish. And what does he learn from this? He learns that this is how God captures Christian souls. That's what you learn from nature. <laughs> Well, Robert Grosstest was inclined to make um, similar conclusions sometimes, but crucially he did this also. He looked at nature, he looked at what was happening, he described it, and he attempted to draw laws from it. He is the first person in the world to know how the rainbow works, and he does it by looking at rainbows. He looks at them in water wheels. He blows water out of his mouth into light to create rainbows, and he looks at them in the sky. And from that, he makes deductions. And once you make deductions from something, you can apply them to other things. So he looks at a prism, He's, he works in optics, and he looks at a prism, 
creating the rainbow and he sees that it is created by light and translucent objects and he says um, he, has, he says that this is something we can maybe now apply to other rainbows but then he looks at a rainbow in a duck's feather and it is not caused by refraction. He's got this word refraction. Nobody's ever described a rainbow like this before. It's refracted light. And he looks at the rainbow in a duck's feather and it's not refraction, that's reflection. But when I look at the rainbow in my prism, in my studio, and then look at the rainbow in the sky, the same law applies. I've deducted from that how light is broken up and the same thing applies because this is a law and it applies down here and it applies up there. And that rainbow up there is caused by refraction. This is revolutionary. This is revolutionary thought. He also does something which is incredibly important. I have no understanding of how this has been airbrushed out of the history of science so consistently. He says this, all reality in our universe can be expressed in lines, figures, and angles. In other words, mathematics, this is geometry. And this is revolutionary as well, because if you work out a mathematical law by observing something, mathematics is universally true. So how light behaves in, in, a, in a glass of water in your, in your room is exactly mathematically how light will behave everywhere in the universe. And he can start working out universal laws now using geometry. And that is incredibly important. Um, another reason why he is important, I had nice pictures of rainbows and I forgot to show you them, I'm getting carried away and, uh, <laughs> with my stuff. Here's his rainbows and that's him lying on his back squirting water <laughs> and you can't quite see him in, in the picture but that's, uh, that's what he's doing there. Okay, rainbows are caused by refraction thanks to Robert Grostest. I campaigned once to have a statue of him in Lincoln for all different reasons, but if he'd just done that, if he'd just <laughs> laid on his back in the park and made rainbows, he should have a statue in this city. Okay, there is another reason why he is great, and it is this. He is, like many scholars of, him, of his generation, the first to say that there are no frontiers to knowledge. Knowledge is not the monopoly of a group of people, in this case, European Christians. Other people have been vouchsafed truths. That's also pretty spectacular. And when he is working on the rainbow, he's not only looking at things, but he's got a text in his hand. And that text comes from a heretic. It comes from an Arab genius called Al-Kindi, who wrote in a tract called The Burning Glass about refraction. And this is where Robert Grostest is getting his knowledge from. He's peeking over the boundaries that Christian Europe has set itself, which says, For, uh, further from here, there is no knowledge and understanding. And he's peeking at that and seeing that there is, and he's using it, and this is wonderful stuff. He's using it with Jewish scholars. He's using it with Arab scholars, the greatest scientists in Europe and in the world, sorry, at this time. And he is also using it with the pagan scholars. Chief of all, chief of all, this great man, Aristotle. Aristotle was banned in Europe at the beginning of the 13th century. He's just arriving up from Muslim Spain and he's banned because he's saying something very, very radical. He's saying you should use your senses to learn. And, um, this is, of course, heretical because we all know since Adam and Eve that we cannot use your senses. We are fall creature, fallen creatures and we can't trust our senses. We must use um, great books and great learning and above all the Bible. And Aristotle is saying, look and listen and use your senses. Robert Grostes makes him palatable to, uh, um, uh, uh, to um, a European audience and this is how he does it. This is an incredible um, achievement. Now, I'm going about this in a very roundabout way, but just bear with me for a second. This is his very short treatise called De Luce, Concerning Light. And in this, he says that at the beginning of the, of, of the, the creation of the universe, we read this in Genesis, God utters two words, the first words spoken in the history of the cosmos. He says, he says, fiat lux, let there be light. And at that moment, there was light. And light struck a part of our universe where there was matter, but the matter was innate. It didn't have dimension and it didn't exist in time. It was innate. And when light hits it, Grosse says it gives it corporeity. So now this matter exists in time and space. 
but Grostes is an observer and he also watches how light behaves and when he's lit, an, when he's lit a lamp in his study he knows instantly that light fills his workshop because light has a unique property in nature it can replicate itself at the speed he says of infinity or as we would say at the speed of light this happens and as it happens light drags matter with it all over the universe creating the planets the stars the black holes and the solar systems this happens the first moment of creation the highly sophisticated understanding of how our universe began and here is a lovely thing it doesn't just stop there it doesn't just stop there because what applies to the universe applies to your mind as well and in your mind you have knowledge and learning now observation is only the basis of that knowledge something wonderful is going to happen later on because when you prepared your mind with this observation and with this learning a thing happens called solertia and at that moment an idea hits your head like god sending a lightning bolt to create the universe and as it hits your head you are filled with a wonderful idea you get it you know it you understand and that is solertia it's akin to the big bang and it's akin to the creation of the universe so i want to just finish saying this robert cross test deserves credit he dis deserves credit for for, 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 for showing us that all reality in this universe, whether it's our own bright ideas or the creation of the universe, are underpinned by this wonderful phenomena, the light fantastic. And he has deserves credit also for this, for firing great bolts of his own luminosity into an age which was far from the dark ages. <laughs>